guest today is Damien Brady. Damien, how are you doing? I am well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing really well. It's late at night here in Chicago, Illinois. Where and when are you? <laughs> I am in Brisbane, Australia, and it is uh, 1.30-ish in the afternoon where I am. So right on the kids' nap time, I'm in my home office hoping that they don't wake up screaming. So, oh, I hope so, for the yes. audience's sake. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, ML Ops, and the reason is because I'm looking at your blog right now, and I see this mm -hmm. long post about ML Ops and DevOps and machine learning, and uh, it's fascinating because I I've done a little bit of machine learning. I've done a lot of DevOps. I haven't done any ML Ops at all. Uh, can you Ooh. tell me what is ML Ops? What is ML yeah. Ops? You say that, but I, I don't. You may have done some ML Ops, I guess. Like so, I didn't know I was doing it. Potentially, yeah. I, I found that I was doing some machine learning back in back in the past, and I didn't really know I was doing that either. Um, so we'll, we'll let's we'll start with what MLOps is. So yeah. MLOps is basically the idea of taking DevOps concepts and applying them to machine learning projects um, in place of uh, you know traditional software development projects. So all of the stuff we normally do with DevOps, um, from you know the collaboration and planning, the build, the um, writing code, running tests, um, you know, the CI CD stuff out to your test sites and staging sites, and then rolling it out to production, and then monitoring what's happening in production and feeding that information back into the work that you're doing. It's all of those ideas, but applied to machine learning projects, which mm -hmm. traditionally are a little bit different. Um, the, the way they're done is is quite a bit different on a day-to-day -day basis than than DevOps. But the um, actual delivery of a predictive model or a machine learning Yeah, let's, model, let's define the machine learning first of all for those. Yeah. Who okay, so um, if we think about a software development, a standard software development, um, uh, some standard software development, right? So somebody will give you a problem and maybe it's something like, um, hey, we need a function that will tell us uh, how much tax to apply to a particular transaction. So as a programmer, you look at that problem and you say, okay, I, I know roughly the logic that's going to work that out for me. You gather the requirements and you as the programmer will write down or write the code that defines that logic so that when there's an input, it'll run through your logic and give you an output. It'll give you a correct answer. Right? Yeah. Machine learning is good for those problems where the logic is much less clear. So the obvious example we keep seeing is image recognition. Like if I was to give you a, a image and say, can you write a function that will tell me whether there's a cat in that image? Like I, I would not be able to guess how that logic would look, right? Mm. And it's pretty unreasonable for somebody to sit down and hand code that kind of thing and get a reasonable result. Um, a little bit closer to that first example, maybe it's something like, uh, given this person's transaction history um, as your bank customer, what's the likelihood if we lend them this amount of money that they're going to pay it back or they're going to default on that loan or something? The logic to define what's important and what's not and in what way and so on is much less difficult to, to write down. So yeah, and there's instead, also not one right answer to that question. Yeah, like exactly Like there is right. for, the, for the tax problem. Yes, that's right. And, and that's where we kind of get into predictions versus... Um, you know, a correct answer. So if you you can write a, a mathematically um, provable result for that first example, what's the tax for this thing? But you can't really do that for the other ones. There's always a chance that somebody's going to give an image or a scenario where the answer is just it's not what your prediction has made. Um, so rather than trying to get somebody to get that logic right, which is unreasonable in a lot of these scenarios. Um, instead, you let the computer work out what that algorithm is. And the way you do that is you provide a whole lot of sample data. So you might have in that, in that second example of are people going to default on their loan, you might have a whole lot of previous loans and all of the data about you know, their average transaction, their transactions per month, um, demographics, although that gets a little bit into ethics, but things like that, all of these other bits of information and then whether they did default on that loan and you use all of that um, previous data that's given you, you know, and the correct answers that you've got, and you run it through some training algorithms and the computer will work out what that logic is, what features are important, what features aren't, and it will come up with a model of how the data fits the answers. And that is essentially just a function. You feed in that data or those, those inputs or those parameters and you get a 
result at the other end, like a probability or something like that. Um, and then the good thing is you can use that in place of a function that you would have written before. The big difference between that and software development, traditional software development, is that um, you, you probably notice that there's not necessarily a, oh, this is how I'm going to solve this problem. So it's a little difficult to predict upfront how much time it's going to take. And so there's a lot more experimentation that happens with machine learning projects. So the idea of, well, are we just going to break it down into pieces? We'll write this part of the function or we'll write this function. We'll commit that. We'll push that to our repo do a CI build and a, and a deployment and stuff like that, and we'll get something closer to what we want. It's not necessarily like that. You might go down dead ends a lot of the time. You might try a particular method for getting a solution. It doesn't work. You might find that some of your data is, is corrupt or not useful, so you need to clean that. So there's a lot more experimentation rather than a, a clear direction towards, towards a final answer. Is that why um, the traditional DevOps doesn't work? on an ml project and the way that it's same way it does on a traditional software project yeah so th especially the um the specific uh processes and the, and the products and things like that don't necessarily lend themselves to that kind of work right. um there's a few other ways that they they don't but um the idea of well we're just going to write pieces and build that and put it into the to the application and deploy that out to production that's going to be closer to to the final answer it may not be the case that you'll get a good answer until, I mean, you may be working on it for weeks or months before you get anything that's that's correct or anything that you want to release to production. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that your CI style things and your um, deployments to test environments can't happen. Like That can still occur, but you just wouldn't want to put it in production until it's going to give you a result. Like Okay, that's fair. Yeah. Um, the other big part, big difference is if you think about a software development, like a traditional one, a build of an application might take minutes, maybe an hour or so if you're unlucky. Um, and it doesn't really need huge resources. Like you're not going to get a gigantic machine with 10 GPUs and, and you know, terabytes of RAM and things like that. You don't really need that to do the build. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of reasonable that every single time somebody makes a change to the code, you rebuild, you run your tests, you make sure it deploys and things like that. A machine learning build, which is the training run, um, that might take days of training on petabytes of data, and it might use thousands of dollars of compute. Um, and so it's not reasonable to have a CI process to do that every single time somebody makes a change. Particularly as the result, you're not actually um, always sure that that's going to give you a better result than what's in production anyway. So there are some other ways of, of handling that. Um, you, but the whole CI, CD, every single time you make a change, you do a build, deploy it somewhere and test it and then promote it. It doesn't really work as well when so you're it's talking not, about it. It's not practical and it's that much time and that much money to yeah, maybe, exactly. maybe get the right answer. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, exactly right. So I kind of I kind of went on a little bit from what ML was, but um, yeah, that that I think highlights the difference between your traditional DevOps and your uh, ML ops or machine learning um, operations or DevOps for machine learning is yeah. Okay, so if you're the ML ops guy on the project, you're you're, you're tasked with uh, building out the the operations piece of this. What are the sorts of things that you ought to be doing? Um, so I I would start at the beginning and say. All of the stuff should be in source control, um, with the exception of your data. That's a whole different story because you might have huge amounts of it. But um, data scientists and machine learning experts are not necessarily software developers. And in fact, a lot of the time, or most of the time, they're, they're not. Um, so they don't always use source control, like as a matter of, of course. Um, so having all of that stuff in source control is important. And that means all of the Python or R or C Sharp or whatever code you're using to do your training, um, whatever steps you're using to filter, um, uh, translate, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, modify your data, you know, clean your data before you get to um, get to that training. That should all be in code as well, and that code should be in source control. Um, okay. And then similarly to DevOps as well, all of the infrastructure you need for your training, so definitions of the size of the machine or the virtual machine, number of GPUs, RAM, um, operating system, 
uh, versions of libraries that you're using and all that kind of stuff that we would normally do with traditional software development. It's important that that stuff is divine, defined in code. Um, and so you have basically everything you need to pick up an existing project with no um, infrastructure at all and actually do a training that is going to be consistent and you know reasonable. Um, so all of that in source control. Uh, and then your pipeline, so your um, your data steps, your data cleaning, data gathering, and data processing steps, your training steps, so all of the stuff that does the training itself, and then any other tasks like when I have a model, save it, I uh, save it into a model repository with metadata that applies to it, you know, accuracy, um, you know, some details about how it was trained and things like that. So all of that stuff. That, that pipeline stuff in source control as well. Um, so it, it overlaps a bit with with what we would want um, for a traditional project, right? All of the stuff in source control, so it's reusable and you can um, collaborate with your team as well, which is, which is something that's not always done in, in machine learning projects. There's a lot of passing things around with USB keys and by email. Um, I won't which, say I've never done that. <laughs> no, I yes, I am I'm guilty of that as well. Um, but yes, the uh, friends don't let friends right click publish is is very much alive in the machine learning world. You know, you'll get your your model produced on a data scientist machine, and then somebody emails that model to one of the developers to say, here, here's the new one. Can you start using that? Um, so along those lines, a an automated um, training pipeline or automated um, kind of, uh, yeah, that, that pipeline of cleaning your data and processing your data, running the training, and then packaging it up into a deployable um, piece, um, whether that's a library that can be used in an application or a, a Docker container is quite common now. Um, just having a model exposed as an API, essentially. Um, and then the continuous delivery stuff or continuous deployment stuff so that you can just push that into an environment and, and try it out. Um, and then, of course, all your monitoring stuff, um, how it's actually performing in production, um, not just is it throwing exceptions everywhere, but how performant is it? Is it giving people results in the time you expect? Um, is it leading to the behaviors that we want? So if you think about like a recommendations engine, so if you purchase this item, maybe here are some other things that you might want that could be a predictive model. Um, so is the model that you just put, pushed out to production, is that leading to more clicks than the previous model? Um, or is it not that valuable? Like, is it not actually providing value to the to the person? Is that, is that something you can automate uh, in the same way that you might create automated tests that run as part of the CICD? Yeah, it's, it's a little harder in a lot of scenarios. I kind of like the, um, the recommendations engine because at least it's, you can think, well, okay, you can measure the number of times that somebody clicks on a recommendation okay. and determine whether this model is better than the previous model. But, um, you know, if you're doing image recognition, maybe it's something like how often are people going back to correct that that algorithm? Or sorry, not correct the algorithm, but if they upload an image, if there's an ability for them to say, oh, no, I need to edit the caption that you've given it because it's not accurate. You know, are they doing that less often with this one than the other okay. one? Okay, that sounds like a semi-automated because you've mentioned some um, uh, human intervention there. Uh, yeah, yeah, and it's not always possible to automate all of that stuff. I mean, yeah. you can run um, validation, uh, model validation and stuff if you have some existing test data and then once it's deployed, you can run through those automated tests to say, well, when I feed in this information, I expect this result. But that's obviously not the real world. It's, it's you know, um it's it's not fake data but it necessarily but it's it's set up by you you know it's your test yeah. data um it doesn't necessarily represent the real world right. um but yeah you can automate that as well i guess there's you guess you could say the same for traditional software development right you have all your tests and you say this is how i think people are going to behave but then in production somebody will find a way to break it that you didn't anticipate uh, very true yeah <laughs> Yeah. So um, similar kind of thing, yeah. Is there anything like, um, you mentioned that it's kind of hard, to, uh, the development process is different, but can we still break things into user stories and tasks and sprints? Is that a part of ML Ops? Um, that, that's one that I've been struggling with, actually. Um, uh, the idea, well, so 
A machine learning project quite often has a singular goal, um, something like, um, you know, create a recommendations engine that that leads to, you know, this this level of click throughs or this level of um, success with that recommendation. Um, actually, doing the work because it's such an experiment driven, exploratory kind of uh, role, this data science role. Um, you may be working for weeks without actually getting something that that um, gives you a good result. You may try a few techniques that you're fairly sure are going to work, but then when it actually when you actually do it, you're realizing you're not getting the results that you want. Um, so it's difficult to kind of break that up into. Um, all right, step one is to build a model that does this because that's kind of the, the entire aim. Um, so the whole idea of all of these tickets on the left hand side, moving them all over to the right hand side and then you're done doesn't really work that well. Um, what I do suggest um, is a kind of a, a nice way of making sure that you're collaborating with your team and keeping track of the work you're doing is when you have a new um, idea for an experiment that you just have a, a basic work item that says, all right, I'm going to try a linear regression using features from this data set um, and I'm going to auto tune them like this. And so you do that work and that might be a, a predictable period of time that you're going to work on that. And if that leads to a dead end, something that's not giving you a good result, then at least you can move that and say, look, it's done. I tried it. Here was the result from it so that other people can see what you've done. And you know, you're keeping track of, of the fact that you've done, done this work. Um, yeah, it's a little bit more fluid, I guess, because you're not you're not always working towards an end goal. Like, well, you're not necessarily making progress towards an end goal um, when you when you're doing your work. I see. Tell me a little about the tooling that uh, you use in MLOps. Is it the same tooling like in Azure DevOps or GitHub or things like that relevant, or yeah. is there specific tooling for MLOps? There is for the most part uh, for most of it for the training stuff. So. Um, for the actual training runs themselves, uh, Azure Machine Learning is the is the tool that, or is the series of services that that helps with a lot of that, and it includes things like um, uh, registration and tracking of of experiments, like training runs, um, the the produced models themselves. It lets you deploy a model to a container very very easily, um, but it also lets you manage things like um, scalable compute. So in other words. A, a VM, a virtual machine definition that is scalable down to you know zero instances, and then when you're running the training, you can scale it up to five or six, and then scale it back down afterwards. Um, uh, known kind of tracked data sources as well. So if you have all of your images for your image training in blob storage, it gives you a nice way of kind of mounting that blob storage inside Azure, so that your script can can access it really easily. Um, yeah, and then there's all the other peripheral tools like um, hosted Jupyter Notebooks, which is a, a kind of, I won't say IDE, but it's kind of a, a, a exploratory engineering tool, I guess, for, for machine learning. And so those are hosted, or those can be hosted in your Azure Machine Learning. There's some things around AutoML and even um, a Machine Learning Designer. So you can just design these pipelines by dragging um, and connecting um, different tasks, different steps, things like get the data from here, split it 80-20 into training data and test data, you know, as these things that you can connect together to get visual visual input. Um, when it comes to the actual building though, that, that machine learning pipeline that uses your managed compute and uses your scripts and things like that, um, it's designed around training runs. So things like unattended runs, so you kick one off and then when it's done, you know, you can be notified to say this training run, which might have taken two days. Um, yeah, it, it's finished now. You can move on to to whatever you wanted to do with that model. Um, now, you could do that in a traditional DevOps tool like um, Azure Pipelines or GitHub Actions, but getting a long running um, build essentially or, or workflow or pipeline that might run for two days is not a not an easy or sometimes possible thing to do. Like you don't want that to be an attended, um, a attended thing. Um, it also doesn't really know what a model is or what a training run is, and so it's not it's not designed to capture you know accuracy metrics and things as you're doing your training. 
Um, so the language is a bit different and the, the kind of things that matter are a bit different. Um, so the training runs themselves, I definitely use Azure Machine Learning. The artifacts, like the training runs and the models and things like that, I'd use Azure Machine Learning. But if you're making a change to your Python code that is in your pipeline, that code might be in GitHub and then GitHub Actions can, um, you know, kick off a workflow when that happens and just tell Azure Machine Learning, hey, do a new training run um, and then send an, send an event back so I can kick off a deployment when the model is completed. So you can use some of those tools as long as you're not doing the, the kind of full training run, which could be days or weeks or whatever right. um, in those tools, I think. So is it um, fair to say that um, Azure Machine Learning, which originally was a tool f for data scientists, uh, yep. that it's now uh, Microsoft is adding tooling to that to help with ML ops? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's had a couple of iterations, I think, the product. Um, it's changed a fair bit now. Um, but yeah, it, it is designed kind of around the, around, you know, getting getting predictive models built and off the ground as quickly as possible, but also this idea of um, that whole process, that MLOps process, uh, making that that nice and, and clean and reliable, I guess. OK, yeah. uh, we've been talking about 20 minutes now. Is there anything that we haven't covered that we should? Uh, Oh look, we could we could go into rabbit holes on on tons of these things. Um, uh, I would, uh, if you're interested in it as well, there's um there's always Microsoft Learn. Um, oh great. Courses. So there's a Microsoft Learn one for uh, Azure Machine Learning um, for the tool, and those are really good because they actually let you try things out and play with it, um, mm. as well as teaching you how it works. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in that, I'd, I'd go and have a look. There's plenty of test data and things like that, example data that you can get started with the ML side of it. Um, so yeah, I'd have a look at the Microsoft Learn stuff um, if, you, if you're interested. And you mentioned earlier, you're speaking about, I think this is off camera, but or before we started recording, but you're, you're doing some yeah. speaking about this, right? What's coming yeah. up for you? Um, what's coming up? It is, uh, there's just some smaller local user groups and then I'm still wet yet to find out about um, Ignite towards the end of the year. There could be a session there. Um, that, that will be virtual, I think, right? They've already announced that. Yep, yep. I think, I think we're doing virtual until the end of next year, kind of. Um, at least that's the, that's the current plan. Um, there's also a bunch of I'm not sure how public this is, but there's a bunch of um, uh, learning paths that we're putting together. So in the last year or two, we were doing these um, Microsoft Ignite the Tour events all over right. the world. Um, they've obviously dried up because people can't go all over the world um, or do them in person. But we had these learning paths that would be five sessions on a particular track um, and they would all flow on from each other. And so we're building those again. There's actually a DevOps learning path now. Um, and then there is a um, AI, for, or AI for developers learning path too. Um, and then there are plans for another um, scalable data stuff. Um, and that scalable data thing would be, um, would include MLOps, but we haven't started that one yet. Um, okay. but there's def yeah, there's definitely a DevOps um, learning path and an AI learning path, yeah. I have a lot of studying to do. <laughs> yeah, well, look, my my reading list is growing rather than yeah. thinking. And it has been for decades, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fact. Uh, yeah. Well, Damien, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate the time, and uh, you stay safe. Yes, thank you. You too. I have always said when you go to deploy your application, Friends don't let friends right click publish. And I think that's true regardless of what technology you're using, whether you're deploying an application, a database, a predictive model, or anything. Friends don't let friends right click publish.